China luxury travel trends. Now this is thoughtful. <laughs> Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. Chinese travelers have become a major force in Asia and beyond, spending over $100 billion on foreign travel in 2012, the first year it surpassed the U.S. and Germany. The days of tour group travel for these consumers are long gone. They increasingly expect customized service and well-planned itineraries. Our experts today include Javier Calvar, Chief Operating Officer of Albatross Global Solutions, Erwan Rambert, Managing Director and Global Co-Head of Consumer and Retail Global Research at HSBC, and Chloe Reuter, Founder and CEO of Reuter PR, to tell you how to appeal to these travelers. But first, with us is Rupert Hugeworth, Chairman and Chief Researcher of Huan Report, which just released a white paper that examines the preferences of Chinese luxury high net worth travelers. Rupert, welcome back to the show. Nice to see you again here, Trevor. So your report says that high net worth individuals in China now spend an average of 20 days a year on holiday, and in 2014, their outbound trips actually increased 17.8% to 116 million. So clearly, Chinese millionaires are spending more time on holiday and more time exploring leisure activities. Can you talk about why this is happening and where they're spending their time the most? Well, I think if you, we've just put out this report called the Chinese Luxury Traveler Report. So it's the fifth year that we've been doing this report and we surveyed 300 super travelers. These are people that I define as who, got, who spent 50,000 US dollars or more, uh, sorry, 30,000 30, US dollars or more uh, on luxury travel products in the last year. So they are ahead of the curve and the reason you need to pay attention is because whatever these people are doing, you know, everybody else is going to be following in say three to five years time. Um, first, we found that you know, the number of outbound trips this year has gone up again. You know, it's not a big surprise. On average, the millionaire in China is now doing four outbound trips. Um, but if you then take them to the, the next zero up, they're probably doing up to six outbound trips a year. So that's quite a lot. And do you think that part of the austerity measures, the reverse effect of that is now these individuals are spending less perhaps on luxury consumption within China and they're heading overseas to get more experiences and perhaps you know, culinary experiences, things that aren't necessarily flashy uh, but are still able to be categorized in the luxury spending category? Yeah, I'd say that there is this, you know, the, the, the austerity campaign has come about at the same time as this insight into the word tuha, and, uh, which means basically rich and no taste. So there's been suddenly this insight, plus there's been this uh, you know, sort of luxury travel growth, which, plus you've then, which means that people have seen a lot outside, plus you've got internet transparency as well. So suddenly you've got this, uh, you can compare the price of your luxury product online really, really, really easily, and it's like come together in a perfect storm. So um, if you put that together, it means that the Chinese uh, sort of sales of luxury have sort of suffered a little bit, I'd yes. say, in the last say, couple of years. And on our research, gifting has come down 30%, say, in two years, at least the spending on gifting in China. Um, but generally speaking, you're seeing that there's been quite a lot of increase in outbound, you know, sort of travel retail. And, and that's, that's also linked very much to the whole travel experiences. Well, and you also touched upon technology and how all of these tools are accessible from smartphones now for these travelers. And part of that should be um, social networks like WeChat, where you see a lot of sharing of travel information, travel tips. Um, there's some of these curated uh, you know, travel experiences that are now advertising on WeChat and spreading the word. How important is technology to furthering this growth? Well, uh, we looked at, I mean, in our research, um, basically WeChat obviously has come right up to the top. You know, last year, last year it was still number two to email for the use on your smartphone. This year it has just sort of gone through the roof and it's absolutely number one. We looked at how, if you're a travel agency or travel company, how do you get your information? Well, 94% of these people have downloaded a travel app. And of those, most of them are, are half and above our sea trip. And then you've got Tunar, which sort of is the, the next big one, if you like. But there, there's, there's quite a difference. And so those, those are the two. But the other thing that we've seen and, you know, outside the social media is the influence of the luxury travel agencies has grown a lot. So if you'd asked me this question five years ago, I would have said, well, actually, there's almost no luxury travel agencies that are any good at the moment. I mean, there are a handful, but there's, they, they have such a small percentage of the market share that it's almost irrelevant. And today, 
um, we find that of the best trips that the millionaires class have been doing, I'd say about, I'd say at least half are being done through the travel agencies, and they're now top 10. So we actually managed to come up with a top 12 um, best luxury outbound travel agencies. We couldn't have done this, say, four years ago. And who's number one, and how long have they been? I mean, the, the average, the average uh, number of years that the, of those 12 um, luxury travel agencies is about, they've only been in existence on average, I'd say about three to four years. So they're brand new. And uh, there are older ones. I mean, there's people like um, HH Travel, which is the uh, uh, bespoke travel of C-Trip. It's a listed company. You've also got Magic Travel, which is the bespoke travel section of um, uh, Utah, which is another big listed company. You've got Diadema. I mean, they've been around for like 15, 20 years even. So they've been but they've had a very small market share. But as people have become more into experiential travel and they're becoming not, they're, they're looking for proper bespoke packages, the luxury travel agencies come up as well. Well, fascinating stuff, Rupert. Thanks again for coming on Thoughtful China. Luxury travel has become a hot topic in today's China market. And the change is obvious. You can see it changes from group traveler to individual travelers. You can also see it changes to further destinations. It started from Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, to Europe, New Zealand, Australia, and today, Africa is also a hotspot. Actually, we also see other changes. First, shopping overseas is such a trend that nobody can ignore it. And uh, Rudolfin actually publicized China Luxury Report every year. And last year, we see a huge jump of duty-free shops. It has become a major shopping channel for all the luxury brands. And also, coming from the statistics of our luxury, uh, luxury clients, they're all telling us Chinese consumers are the consumers following exchange rates change. But let's look at it this way. Chinese consumers, they also consider shopping overseas a culture experience. That's why any country that can provide shopping opportunity plus cultural interaction and local experiences can win Chinese customers' heart. So if you give Japan as an example, it provides shopping opportunities, but it also provides local culture cultural interactions, and you have a lot of opportunities to see beautiful sceneries and local stories. That's what makes Japan a hot destination today for Chinese consumers. We're back in the studio today with Javier Calvar, Chief Operating Officer of Albatross Global Solutions, Erwan Rambert, Managing Director and Global Co-Head of Consumer and Retail Global Research at HSBC, and Chloe Reuter, Founder and CEO of Reuter PR. Welcome back to the studio. Chinese consumers are dominating the headlines in terms of travel and spending overseas. Um, they, in 2012, they spent over 100 billion on foreign travel. But we're really focusing today on the high end of the market, the luxury sector. So Javier, can you talk about some of the trends in terms of Chinese consumers and where they're traveling to now and how they're spending? For example, are they still spending the majority of their money on shopping when they do leisure travel? Right, uh, Chinese consumers are, are, are traveling in tremendous numbers. Um, the, um, the one of the agencies within the United Nations uh, forecast that uh, 100 million Chinese consumers could travel overseas by 2020. Well, that number was reached uh, last year. Um, when they travel, they still spend most of their most uh, most of their uh, uh, money on on shopping. That's very true, uh, but they are also looking for experiences. Uh, and uh, we are seeing that both locally and overseas, the amount is spent on experiences, the amount is spent on, on, on doing things that are new to them is also increasing significantly and much faster than the amount they spent on shopping. And Chloe, what are some of the hottest destinations right now for Chinese consumers traveling abroad? I think that you're, you're still seeing some of the traditional destinations uh, stay very high up on the list. So you know, whether they're Southeast Asian destinations or further afield in Europe. But I think that what's also interesting to note is you've got quite a few people who are traveling from China, for example, to New Zealand and to really f further afield destinations looking for that amazing natural experience. And I think when you look at experiences, they're even looking at more thrill-seeking experiences in those areas. 
so safaris or yeah. you know treks into the wilderness really beyond the cities I was really impressed we were in New Zealand uh, just a couple of months ago and I was amazed by the amount of Chinese who are actually renting cars and caravans and going on self-driving holidays and I think that really shows that in such a short time you've had this mat maturity of the market it's people who are now really independent and going off and staying in little bed and breakfasts and you know, doing their own food shopping in local markets and basically it's, it, to me it just is, shows the sophistication of the market. And Erwan, in your book you talk about some of the factors and you've created an acronym TRAVEL uh, to represent a lot of the factors that are influencing Chinese travelers abroad. But I'd like to focus specifically on government uh, regulations and the austerity measures because that was one of the inspirations for your book. Do you see those regulations impacting the decisions about where Chinese consumers go? For example, uh, are they going to places like Macau less because they believe there's more scrutiny there? I think, um, yeah, I think the anti-corruption, anti-graft campaign uh, has had initially quite a, uh, quite a big hit on a few sub-segments only, so Mao Tai or Cognac or um, high end watches, for instance. Um, I don't think it hit uh, the industry throughout, but it's true that that campaign started in August, September 12. It took quite a few months, actually, for consumers to understand how serious the administration was about it. Um, so the hit was really early 13 <laughs> and lasted you know, for about a year and a half. I think, uh, to be fair, we're, we're past that to a certain extent. Not that corruption's coming back or anything, but it's, it's simply that you've eliminated that from the equation. I would, um, I would say that um, Chinese people are uh, traveling more and more and purchasing abroad for uh, different reasons to that, uh, more for price arbitrage reasons, uh, and also for reasons that are linked to uh, storytelling. So, uh, you know, we mentioned New Zealand, uh, you can mention the Maldives, um, you can mention uh, also, you know, this idea that uh, Hong Kong, for example, was a phenomenal luxury hub and is losing out right now to other destinations because Hong Kong has been almost only about shopping. Um, and it's true that Chinese consumers are looking for something a bit different. So, you know, there's a big neighborhood in Hong Kong called TST, where traditionally a lot of wealthy mainlanders used to go and shop in luxury. Uh, we've been uh, basically uh, publishing on this idea that there's a new TST in the region, which is Tokyo, Seoul, Taipei. Um, you, you know, so basically Japan, uh, Korea, and Taiwan. You go to Japan because it's cheap, yes, but there are also a lot of things to do from a cultural standpoint. You go to Korea because anything Korean is cool. There's a great influence from uh, you know, K-pop music, uh, uh, soap operas, uh, an obsession for cosmetics, culture, etc. Uh, you go to Taipei probably to renew with your roots, to go to the National Museum, to learn about your, cu your culture, to, you know, and, and also because they speak the same language as you do, whereas in Hong Kong they don't. Um, so a, a lot of uh, people think it's only about price. It's true that price arbitrage does matter, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, Japan and continental Europe are doing so well right now with Chinese tourists, but there are other attributes that they're uh, looking for. I just want to touch briefly on Hong Kong because you are based there, and obviously it's been in the headlines over the past year in terms of a, a bit of an identity crisis or you know strained relationship. So is there anything that you think Hong Kong can do to change its image for Chinese consumers to more closely match uh, a place like Taiwan, for example? I think you need diversity. Um, so, so there is you know, uh, potential political, cultural, so social issues on one side. But if you look at shopping, I think the issue of Hong Kong in terms of the retail experience is it's become quite dull. Uh, there's not a lot of diversity. If you go to Seoul, not only is the Korean culture you know, uh, a fascinating uh, area for you, but there's a lot of diversity. There's, there are a lot of brands that you won't come across elsewhere. Um, so I think what probably Hong Kong can do is rethink the footprint. You know, what am I offering to consumers? If I'm just offering brands and products that you can find anywhere else, and actually a lot of the shopping malls in Hong Kong look like the next shopping mall in Hong Kong, um, you need to offer diversity, you need to offer entertainment, you need to offer uh, you know, food and beverage experiences that you won't find anywhere else. Um, if you look at shopping abroad by the Chinese, uh, about 58% of their uh, spending is on shopping globally, but it's 74% in Hong Kong. So it tells you that Hong Kong is all about shopping. As long as Hong Kong is all about shopping, that'll be the issue. You need diversification. 
And Chloe, you've been on the show multiple times and talking about travel and experiences and everyone on the panel today agrees that that's something Chinese consumers are looking for. Can you talk specifically about some clients that you're working with and what they're doing to make these travel experiences memorable for Chinese consumers? Oh, I think first of all it's important when we talk about these experiences, I don't think that when we're looking at the top, uh, the top level of travelers, these very sophisticated travelers, I don't think they're at all different from very sophisticated travelers in other markets. I think it's very easy to start labeling Chinese travelers in a very particular way. I think that with a lot of the clients we work with, they're not necessarily um, creating unique experiences for Chinese travelers. I think they're creating unique experiences for discerning and luxury travelers. If we look at our client Aman Resorts, you know, at, the, at the core of their DNA, it's all about creating an unforgettable and unique experience within a cultural context. And if we look at you know, the, the, the Chinese now traveling more and more to Aman, you know, they're extremely discerning and sophisticated. And I don't think that Aman is changing the way that it offers things. I think perhaps you know if, if people request a Chinese speaking guide and those sort of things, that's no problem to arrange. But I think that these very sophisticated travelers, they want the same things that people from around the world want. They want something that you know is, is unique, that gives them talk value, and um, that allows them to you know be enriched by something very, very special. So I, I don't think that I think that maybe brands who try too hard to offer something extremely unique just for the Chinese, I think they're probably going down the wrong avenue and they're thinking that the Chinese are very different when I don't think they are. Interesting. Javier, do you agree? Do you, uh, when in your experience working with European brands that are trying to attract the very important Chinese consumers, do you think that they're doing enough to cater to that market or as Chloe suggested, perhaps they shouldn't overfocus on them? I think there is, I think there is a balance. <coughs> To be a strike, and as Chloe said, if 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 Chinese consumers see you as as, as doing things very Chinese, can be seen as patronizing as well. Um, <coughs> but what we've seen, um, I, I think there is a fundamental problem when it comes to Chinese travelers, and is the stereotypes that are so rooted in in people's minds. Uh, they tend, or we tend, to put all the Chinese travelers in one in, in, in the same in the same. Uh, bucket and, and and the Chinese traveler is 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 a ter is, is is not homogeneous. Um, at at Albatros we talk about two main types of of, of Chinese, the, what we call the status seekers, uh, whose um, aim is to accumulate wealth and, and 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 they tend to do things for you know to convey a sense a certain a certain image versus the appreciators who are a lot more interested in experiences. Um, they are all more engaged with luxury in a more sophisticated type of way. Right, <coughs> those two groups of people are traveling to Europe, are traveling any, everywhere. Um, and, and, and a lack of understanding of that diversity means that uh, um, a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, hotels, a lot of brands do not understand their needs. Um, they lack an understanding of cultural nuances as well. Um, but there are, there, are, there are very interesting developments uh, um, uh, taking place. So for example, at a, at a very practical, at a very practical level, we've seen, um, we've seen hotels to have um, um, uh, uh, Chinese breakfast uh, for, for the Chinese guests. Uh, we see uh, companies like Emirates and Qatar um, giving greater uh, baggage allowance uh, because they know that the Chinese like shopping and therefore they need, they need to carry back more bags than they take with them when they leave. Uh, so that, those are very practical things that some companies are doing. Um, then if you, take, if you take that to the next level in terms of understanding um, uh, the, the Chinese culture, you got places like, for example, the uh, Montage Beverly Hills Hotel that has um, welcome notes on, on, on their pillows written in Chinese. Uh, you have the Hilton Hotel, for example, that will never put a, a Chinese guest on the fourth floor because they understand the negative connotation that the number four has in, in China. 
Uh, right. Um, at more practical levels, for example, uh, payment options. Uh, you have uh, the Hyatt Hotel that allows uh, payment through through Union Pay, and in fact, towards the end of last year, they had a promotion of 20% uh, discount on their on their room rates for anyone that wanted to pay. Uh, through through Union Pay, you had Delta Airlines that allow payment of of, of, of their bookings through um, through AliPay. So you, you got Harrods uh, in, in in London uh, with something like 100, 100 points uh, where Chinese consumers can pay with their with their Union Pay cards. So so those are those are very practical things that, that some brands some brands are doing. So in a lot of ways, Chloe's point was these thoughtful touches are things that any consumer would appreciate. Correct, correct, correct. And what, what they're trying to, we're trying to do, as Chloe said, is trying to make the experience more memorable. Uh, again, another example, uh, another example the, uh, the, the Hilton Hotels. In some of the, in some of the, uh, some of the uh, properties where there is a, a large contingent on, of Chinese, they have tangerines and oranges in their lobby because of the connotation, the positive connotation that it has. For the Chinese, of course, that is going to contribute to that, to that experience that when they come back home, they're going to talk about. So all of you seem to agree that the Chinese consumer today is incredibly important on the global luxury uh, and travel market. Do you see that trend continuing for the next five years, ten years? A hundred percent, yes. <laughs> totally. I, th I think we're just at the beginning of outbound travel trends. I mean, uh, Javier made the, made the point earlier that you have more than 100 million trips. Uh, actually, I think last year was 116 million trips. Out of those trips, more than 60% were to Hong Kong and Macau. So the world hasn't been discovered yet. I mean, it's just starting now. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Yoku, Tudo, and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. We'll see you again.